Uh, Hi, uh, thank, thank you all for braving the maze to get here. Um, it proves that you're all the best and brightest, and I'm glad to get to talk with you. Yeah, uh, um, I'm glad to see that none of you got eaten by the Gru. Um, anyway, I'm uh, Will Woods and Stephen Gallagher. And we are here to talk about eliminating scriptlets for fun and profit. Um, there's actually, it's not actually that fun, and there's no money to be made, but we're doing <laughs> it anyway. Um, and I am sort of gratified that you're all here to see this because uh, it means that we're actually going to try and do this thing. And I, I kind of have a, a question I wanted to poll you on. Are you more here to figure out why we're going to do this or figure out how we're going to do this? So why, raise your hand. OK. And how? OK, good to know. I'm glad y'all are with me. Um, <laughs> <You're>... <laughs> oh, all the cursing that I'm trying not to do. Uh, anyway, so what what are scriptlets? Well, it seems like y'all already know that, but you know, they're, I'm gonna run through this just because it's good to make sure that we're all on the same page about what we are actually talking about. So, scriptlets are the thing in RPM. It's like a shell script usually that runs in one of several, so many different hooks during package installation. Um, there's a million of them: pretans, preen. Uh, post in, pre un, post un, post trans, trigger in, trigger run, trigger post un, trans file, trigger, trans file, trigger, etc. There's uh, 20 something. Um, and what they're for is basically in practice, we use it to handle anything that RPM doesn't or can't do on its own. Um, things like running LD config after installing libraries, uh, adding and removing users, enabling newly installed services, generating SSH keys, and things like that. Um, the problem, what is the problem? Well, I think you all already know what the problem is, but the problem is that it makes everything bad. And um, it makes me personally cry at night. Um, it's true, I've seen it. <laughs> but, I, I mean, here's the deal, right? Like, everything runs as root, which is horrifying. And one of these times, I am actually gonna set things up so that uh, I don't think Adam is here, but his, his, like, during the talk, his computer is just gonna catch fire or something, because I'm going to put scriptlets on his system, because you can do that. It's right there. Oh, good. Well, this time you're safe. <laughs> but the fact that we run these, we execute arbitrary code as root in the middle of the package transaction every single time we do every package, sometimes like multiple times per package, makes me lose sleep at night. Um, they're weird and they're hard to maintain. Like everybody who has, nobody, well, there are some scriptlet experts, but most packages are written by people who don't really want to deal with packaging. And so they do the bare minimum to get it working. My favorite is that a lot of the Java stuff uh, is packaged. All the scriptlets are written in Lua because the guy who wrote it, I, uh, the person who wrote it, um, wasn't a Linux programmer at all and didn't know shell. But they figured out Lua pretty easily. So they just wrote it all in Lua. So it's doing things like l making soft links, but doing it in Lua because they didn't know about LN. Uh, it's fine. That's totally valid. We allow this. Um, it's really hard for anybody else to maintain. Um, and, you know, it just, it makes everything super duper slow. Um, I think Lars is here or was here, but hey, Lars, you can verify for me. It's very slow. It's very slow. See? I mean, we... <laughs> See? We all believe all right. Lars. Yes, Lars, absolutely. Um, there's a demo in, I've given in previous versions of this talk of a tool, of a prototype tool that uh, my team built that um, basically does a, does a system install, but it does it rather than doing all of the RPM stuff, it just kind of takes all the RPM payloads and mushes them together and emulates the scriptlets. And usually an install like that takes about 5, 10, 15 minutes. We do it in six seconds. We haven't even bothered optimizing it yet. It just takes six seconds. It's I.O. bound. It just, it takes that long to write out a tar file. Um, so scriptlets are why everything is slow. Like, everything we do with RPM could be hundreds of times faster and way easier if we just get rid of them. And I know you're all aware of these problems, but it's good to sort of have a shared understanding of this so that we can explain it to everybody else so they stop getting in our way and making more scriptlets happen. Um, they're also, they are under design, designed, and I don't want to pick too much on RPM. No, I really do want to pick on RPM a lot, but I'm not going to because it's kind of mean. It's, it's just like taking candy from a baby. It's just you feel bad about it. Um, but the candy's delicious. The candy is delicious. But yeah, it's, it's kind of mean to beat up on a package format that was designed in like 1990, and its main goal was to be fast when you loaded it off of a floppy disk. Like, it's really good at that. RPM's great if you really need to read the header quickly off of a floppy disk. We don't do that as much as we used to. <laughs> so it's not super great anymore, um, and it's kind of become a problem. And opaque and non-deterministic, this is the thing that really kills me, is because I want installation and upgrade and image builds to be safe, uh, secure, 
reliable and fast. And as long as we're executing scriptlets, it can never be any of those. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, just, to, uh, just to say, uh, when, when the reason for that is when we want to build an image, uh, like he said, it's, it's a lot faster to, to do an install with no scripts and then make a few changes after the fact. And what we want to be able to do is introspect those spec files and the, and the, or the disk git and see, oh, this package wants these users and this uh, thing in here. And so we can re-implement that for the image builder, do that once at the end, a single f-sync, and we're talking, couple, what, three or two, three orders of magnitude you know, performance increase by right. doing it that way? Right. Uh, which is significant, especially if we're talking about things like CI. Right. So, so this is sort of a long game that we're playing because it's, we're not going to get rid of them overnight. A lot of the complexity of building the things that we build has over time accumulated in scriptlets to the point where there's tens of thousands of lines of code that like nobody really understands. But if you don't run all of it, your images don't work. Um, and so we sort of have to slowly figure out how to replace or what all of it is doing. Like we have to go through all the scriptlets, find out what all of them are doing, and replace them all with something else. Um, and that's not going to happen immediately. So I can't just be like, today we've deleted all the scriptlets. Now let's all drink till our hearts stop. That's not what we get to do today, unfortunately. But we'll get there. Anyway. Anybody, anybody want to guess what that does? This creates an empty file bar log log. It right. does. This is one of what, eight There's different one, ways we found that people right, do that? Right. Like anybody who's done enough bash can think of seven other ways that you could create a file. You could use touch. You could just do you know, greater than and then the file name, and bash will create the file for you. Um, there is like 18 different ways you can create a file. And so it's really hard for us to look at scriptlets and tell, oh, this one's creating a file. They're not introspectable. So we are like, we're going to end up as a community having to manually read through every scriptlet in Fedora. And that's not great, but every package has a maintainer, right? So it's really, you just only have to look at your own packages, hopefully. So, so one of our goals is to write enough uh, sets of guidelines that we can help people who may not be deeply experienced packagers figure out better ways than what they've been doing. Right. The thing that we've messed up um, historically is that we didn't give packagers the tools to do the things they needed to do, but we gave them you know, the Swiss Army chainsaw that is shell scripts, and they've used it and sometimes cut their own fingers off, and sometimes ours, um, and sometimes we cut off our own fingers. If they put this line in, in, in a post scriptlet or something, it's a very bad idea because it will wipe their log if it was already there. Yep. yep. And also, we have to have dev for that to work, which means that now, because some scriptlets want to have, because we can't predict whether or not a script that will need dev, and this one will break if dev isn't there. Therefore, every script that has to execute in an environment where it can see slash dev. And we just have to hope they don't do anything bad. Ha, ha, ha. So here is a fun bug. This, this, we had a bug in Fedora 26, uh, specifically in server. Server doesn't come with the GUI enabled by default. But you know, maybe you want a GUI on your server. So you install GNOME or KDE, and it wouldn't come up. Like, no matter what you did, it just wouldn't start. Uh, and of course, the bug, the fix, turned out to be in the Fedora release package. And it turned out to be that we forgot that percent sign. Obviously. It's <laughs> there was, uh, there, uh, for those of you who don't know Lua, which includes me when I wrote this, uh, <laughs> the difference between this line and this line is that this line will replace any, it will, will remove the set of files that starts with eight and zero. This line will remove the, any file that starts with eight. <laughs> right. Yeah. The other terrible thing about, about <laughs> R R RPM and spec and stuff is that not only is it like Turing complete or several Turing complete languages, but it's <laughs> several, several of the worst Turing complete languages you can possibly use. So, yeah, Lua and Shell. Yay. But the, pro the real problem here was less that the script that was wrong and more that. It took some seriously deep dive, uh, yeah. some serious deep dive, and some genuinely uh, dedicated individuals to figure right. out that's where the problem was. It is an enormous maintenance burden for the people working on Fedora and people who are just want to just be packagers. My my big goal is that packaging, uh, packaging, like using packages, should be the same way we use libraries. Like when you run a dynamically linked library, you don't think about how linkers have to work or any of that. When you build code, you don't think much about libraries. It just kind of magically happens. And packaging, in a way, is kind of like you're dynamically linking a file system, except everything is terrible and nothing works. And I would like it to be a lot more like, you know, you assume that when you run LS, it's going to figure out how many libraries it needs to load. And there's a lot of them, but it just 
happens. We don't think about it anymore. That's how packaging should work for people. Someday. In, fair, in fairness, that has been an, uh, that is the result of an awful lot of work from an awful lot of individuals. But would it, wait, what is that, uh, that linking works that smoothly? Right, right. Um, and I'll ramble and about it's that. It's our turn to do the same yeah. for the packaging process. Right, right. It's, it is our time to sort of figure out how to make the file system, the way that you build a file system image, work as reliably and predictably as the way that ELF and linkers and loaders make your memory space for each process. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it kind of proves my point. If you shouldn't need to think about it. Uh, anyway, oh yeah, here's, all the, um, here's a list of what happens when you install a package. Um, for every package, and, rem and so RPM has to run fsync before and after each of these steps. Um, and it, so when you're doing a package or a system upgrade, uh, I don't, one of the things that I did before this was I worked on uh, upgrade tools. I actually have written like four of them, sorry. Um, but uh, pre-upgrade and then fed up and then DNF system upgrade. Um, and part of the reason I'm so mad about this is because the reason that upgrades take like an hour to run is because they have to do all of this. And the ironic part is that your end system, something like 80% of the files are unchanged. So like it takes an hour for you to change, for you to change, you know, what works out to like 10% of the data on your disk. And it shouldn't be like that, but this is what we're doing with our time. Um, so, and it's very common, like 50, like half the packages in your system probably use it. Um, we already have established, but I'm going to tell you right now, we've done prototypes. We do not need scriptlets to make working images. We've all, <laughs> there's more than one of us in the room that has written a, an image build tool that skips all the scriptlets and everything can be made to work. So like, we can do this. We just, and I'm thanking you for coming along with me on this ride. Um, so yeah, what are we gonna do about it? Um, and I did, yeah, this is, so yeah. At some point, I did actually go through and read every single scriptlet in every single package in RHEL. And I did a lot of it in a bar because you have to have alcohol when you do that. Um, <laughs> and what it comes down to, the way, that the, the way that we are able to build an image in six seconds is because I spent way too much time figuring out what scriptlets do and realizing they don't need to be there. There's six things that they do. And if I'm wrong about this, please, we'll, we will talk about that later, because I really want to know. But like, nobody has been able to come up with an example that falls outside of these six tasks. Um, I would like to hear some, because I do want to make sure that we're, getting, we're giving people tools to handle the things they need to do. So the first one is users and groups. And this is new. So thank you to uh, Harold and company. Um, we have, we're introducing some new macros. We're trying to get this wow, in that is, that is entirely unreadable. That's really unreadable. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> Well, if you, can, if you want to go to the OS build link here, you can see the file I pulled that from. But uh, we're going to add some macros to um, RPM, hopefully in Fedora 30, so that rather than actually adding users and groups uh, manually in your scriptlet, you just kind of do this stuff. Um, so, so this is going to be part of a, a two-phase uh, approach that we want to take to changing out users and groups. Uh, the first is, I th how many different ways did we discover that people were doing this? Was it, I think, was it north or south of 11? I forget. Creating users and groups? Yeah, uh, in different ways that people have done that. Despite the fact that we actually have clear guidelines on how you're supposed to do it, there are, there, there are definitely uh, more than eight different ways that we have seen people doing it. Yeah, I found a binary. Uh, I found binaries. I, I didn't know there was a, uh, there's a command in the password or in the PAM package that can create users for you. I didn't know that. Of course there is. Yeah. Um, so the first step there is try to get everybody to move over to using uh, a set of macros to accomplish this that we can then centrally manage to, uh, to make sure that everyone is uh, following exactly the same process uh, to, create, uh, to create them. Further down the road, we've been talking with the RPM uh, maintainers, and they are willing, but not yet sure how, to make this a first class feature of RPM. And so when that day comes, uh, we'll just change the macro definition, and all of these packages will automatically be using na RPM native me uh, mechanisms instead. Right. Um, and that's, uh, that's the goal. And you know, there's an old saying that I just now made up about how you have to build a uh, bridge from both sides of the river. You can't just, like, try and, you can't just go forward, and you can't just be like, eh, fuck it, we're going to burn it all down and start on the other side. We kind of have to go, we have to deal with what we have now and figure out how to get to the world we want to be in. So like, this is how we get from the world we're in now to RPM natively managing the things we want it to manage. Um, one of the interesting things about this that I'm going to, that I, I think will be retained, is that um, one of these things, maybe in the files, but it's going to also, so we are, it does generate a prescript, and you're like, well, I thought we were getting rid of scriptlets. That's more scriptlets. Well, yeah, we'll get there. Because one of the things that actually happens here is that um, it, it drops a file into place that other tools could read. 
rather than, so rather than just blindly executing the scripts, we can look at the, there's gonna be like a JSON file that says, it describes the users that would be created. And your tool can find that file in the package, in, well, through the package headers, read that file and be like, oh, this package wants to create these users and then do the right thing. So you don't need to execute code at all to make, well, inside the image to do it. Um, so yeah, that's users and groups. Uh, we have a story for how that's gonna go forward. There's more details in the packaging committee ticket and... Um, oh, and there's one more uh, thing I'll mention. You'll notice that the, uh, if you can read it, that the scripts do not say, uh, the scripts are OS build underscore group add and OS build underscore user add. And that is because we're trying to make this mechanism at least uh, a little bit more open-ended uh, as a framework so that if there are other uh, common scripts that we discover, we can, uh, we can merge into this. Uh, we'd rather, we'd, ra we'd rather try to incorporate it into, into this same uh, framework and save ourselves uh, a little bit of work and, some, and simplify uh, how end users use it down the road. Right. So. So we're leaving ourselves room to add more of these things, um, but we don't have specific plans for them yet. Um, so for system cuddle type stuff, where you're starting, well, uh, where you want to start or enable a service because it's just been installed and you need to set it up, that's what systemd presets are for. Please Lovely. use them. Right. I, 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 I get very angry when I, fi oh, when I find that <laughs> people are calling system, con uh, system control in their script. That it's, it makes me very upset. I do believe there is a, um, there is a packaging guideline that says you are not supposed to run system control in yes. your scriptlets. Yeah, so don't do that. There, there are very few exceptions that are occasionally granted when uh, bad old behaviors can't g migrate to the correct behavior without doing so, but those are only allowed for a release until you fix it. Okay. So. And do you have to go back later and delete it? Yes. Good. Um, so yeah. The network manager recently went through that. Yeah. So the short answer is if you if you have or see a if you see something, tell someone. <laughs> uh, if you see a package using system control in a script, tell the maintainer to stop it because and if that maintainer Or start, I've seen them, I've seen packages yeah, that system control start, start so. really bothers me. Yeah, which is not great if you're trying to build an image and doing or trying to, or, or the package is installed in Anaconda. Right. <laughs> yeah. Don't you have any services that, can, that have to be stopped during the update? That is, they, they can survive uh, updates when they are running. Don't, don't you have such services? I, so for, for the purpose of this talk, I am ignoring updates. Because, <laughs> uh, because frankly, I don't give a shit. Um, I, I, however, do. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> that, is, that is actually a, a case that we, pro we probably need to do a little more consideration on. So uh, talk to us after the talk. And uh, yeah. we, 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 do, we do need to think a little bit about that. Right. I mean, when I talked about the, the six tasks, the, whoops, whoops, oh no. Uh, these six, these, this is only during initial installation. There are other things, like obviously you have to migrate um, config files and things like that sometimes. So there are other tasks that happen during updates, but that's... But even still, a lot of those, uh, we're, we'll get to the next, to the next one on the topics. Yeah. Uh, so some, some of what you're saying about upgrades will be resolved by this next one as right, well. Right, right. But you say we should use system D presets instead of calling system CTL, but uh, is there also the rule that you should, we should actually call a system CTL presets through that service to actually make the preset That stuff, so uh, the question uh, uh, for, the, for the recording was uh, should we make sure, uh, shouldn't we have a permission to call system control preset to apply certain, uh, certain things? And the answer to that is the macro, uh, the, the standard system D macros that you're supposed to be using will handle that when it is appropriate. Right. Like so it, that you does have to You shouldn't happen. be typing it yourself. Right, but your script shouldn't be calling it. Um, so uh, empty and default files, okay, like the sure. example I showed, well, that's what tempfiles.d is for. Like it can create an empty file really easily. Most of the cases, uh, it can also copy in a uh, default configuration. Um, I should, I'm gonna put together examples of these at some point. Um, <laughs> I keep saying I'm gonna do that and then it was like Christmas time and I didn't feel like it. Um, but somewhere I will be putting together uh, some examples of how to do common tasks and especially if People want to tell me I need to do this. How should I do it with a system file snippet? We'll figure it out. But most of the time, where you're copying files around or moving files around, and even I think temp files can do minor edits to files. Like if you're setting a default configuration parameter, um, those things should be ha handled by tempfiles.d, which is an increasingly misnamed tool. But f <laughs> whatever, it's fine. Um, so if you're creating spe system-specific data, 
you should be doing that in a specific service. And I will right. let Stephen talk about this. Uh, and this is, uh, is going to answer some of the questions about upgrade. So one of the problems with, gener with generating images or, uh, you know, a ver or copying something to be a, a base for a, vir for a virtualization that you clone is that if you are generating system-specific data or need to do, an, or need to do uh, some transforms on an upgrade, doing that in the package updater, not a great place for it because chances are it's not, ex it, it, there's a good chance in the modern system that that's not actually executing in a, uh, a, a running environment anymore. It may be in, executing in a container build or a, or a virtual machine build. Um, and so what we want to actually convert people over to doing is, if you're, if you're talking about any kind of a service, um, you want to add, add, add on a little helper uh, systemd unit that, that fires as a, as, as a dependency on your main service, who starts up and sees, do I need to do any initial configuration or upgrade process? Do that and then let the main service start. So if you upgrade your 389, uh, basically this should just wait until your, your next reboot or your next time you restart the uh, service and it'll do the upgrade at the start of the service instead of during the, packaging during the package upgrade. Uh, which is a lot safer too, because you don't actually know what state the uh, the system might be in in the middle of a package transaction. Right. Um, you you can know the you can do this and run it in the end state. Yeah. I An mean, example. Uh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say one example of one of these that we did fairly uh, fairly recently is um, Apache. If you have Mod SSL installed, the first time you uh, when you installed the uh, package, uh, the Mod SSL package, it used to uh, look at your system, see if you had a, a certificate uh, installed in the standard location, and if not, it would generate a, uh, a default self-signed certificate. This was really bad for image generation because, uh, first of all, you'd, all of your images would have exactly the same certificate, which is probably not what you were going for. Um, and beyond that, uh, even if you deleted it from your image, you still had to instruct whoever was cloning it on how to recreate it for that, uh, for that image. So we added one of these uh, services, and now whenever you, the first time you start HTTPD, or if you delete this and restart it, you'll get a, you'll get a freshly uh, created certificate. And that's uh, also side benefit. That's now happening in a running system where you've had time to generate some entropy. So it's right. not so you're not running the risk of creating the certificate hanging your your image creation or your install process. Right. Um. So yeah, in general, any if you're creating any sort of system specific data, you should be doing it this using this. This, these sets of guidelines, um, and yeah, there isn't really much more to say about that. We, we've, we've got this one sorted out. Please don't do that in your package scriptlets. Um, so for system config stuff, this, this happens sometimes where people like set up firewall rules or like turn SE Linux on and off or like insert a kernel module. Holy hell, please don't do that. Uh, I don't yep. like it when I'm trying to build an image and during the image build, the image build tool tries to insert kernel modules on my host system. That's not cool, man. Please don't do this to me. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Basically, there are zero cases where this is an acceptable solution and uh, there are non-zero cases of them in Fedora. Right. This is a bad idea. Change my mind. Um, <laughs> change, uh, change my mind afterward. Yeah. If you don't mind, uh, we want to get through the slides Thank eventually. You, but yeah. Um, so really, and the last, the last is sort of a big category, and it's caches and catalogs. It's, thing, it's dynamically generated files that I am forced to admit we do need for a working system. Um, so file triggers are great for this. Um, ldconfig is the canonical example. Every time you install a library, you, do, you technically don't need to run ldconfig, but you really do want to. Um, so in Fedora, as of Fedora 28, we handled that automatically using file triggers. We kind of, I guess, didn't tell people, or maybe we not did. everybody we just got didn't the memo. Enforce it. It's not enforced. Well, we don't need to really, I guess we can enforce it now because as of Fedora 30, there are no scriptlets that run ldconfig anymore. It happens automatically. You don't need to worry about it. It is not your problem. Yeah. Um, so we're working on equivalent solutions for uh, install info when you have an info file for GTK update icon cache and various other tools that are like that. If font you maintain con font config, font config, etc. If you maintain one of these tools and you aren't using or you don't have a file trigger set up to handle the thing where all of the descendant packages need to run the thing to you know get themselves hooked into the cache or catalog, talk to us and we'll figure it out. Um, all, Etsy alternatives is is one that sadly is still necessary and sadly is still in the core system. Um, in that we ship, you need uh, even the, the most minimal system possible still install, uh, installs bin utils, and we ship two load or two linkers because of reasons 
that I don't want to think about. Um, so the plan there, and I, I don't know if anybody who uh, works on that upstream is in the room, but um, I, I've filed a thing with them, and we've ha got like vague consensus that, yeah, it'd be a good idea to have a config file format for that, and you just drop a file into place, and then things happen with their normal file triggers. Uh, nobody's written that code. Nobody's written the file format. I proposed one, but we haven't actually done that. So if anybody wants a nice little bit of thing that they can contribute to upstream and you know, be a hero, uh, that's something you can work uh, on. Talk to me. I should put a link there. Um, that's really about it. Those are the six things we know about. These are our plans for getting rid of them. If we all work together, we can roll this rock up the hill and be done with scriptlets once and for all, eventually. Um, so, yeah, are there any, this would be the place, I'll let you say what you were gonna say. Yes, sorry. We'll start with your question. Yes, uh, for, uh, for the uh, configuration thing, uh, uh, I know of one case with uh, a Linux board dance, where the, there was the, the thing that, uh, for a just-in-time debugger, like in this particular case, was the KD uh, K crash of the concrete setup to work. Uh, you need to have the P-trace self capability. And the AC Linux, the AC Linux people said, no, we're not going to allow you to do this by default, and you should just enable the P-trace self boolean in, in a package triplet. And so the, the package that ships Dr. Conga does exactly that now. So, All right, so, so there's a scriptlet that en enables a boolean, and that's what the SE Linux, so, so there is yeah. at least one package that uses yeah, SE Linux they, stuff they, to they enable they a boolean, and the SE Linux guys, uh, that was their suggested solution? Do I understand yeah. correctly? Well, okay. uh, it doesn't sound to me like it was this, like necessarily, uh, let me try to re uh, rephrase the, sta the statement too. So, um, so there exists a package, it's a debugger of some sort. Um, yeah, yeah, the Dr. Conk with a crash handler for KDE. Okay, the crash, ha uh, the crash handler for KDE uh, needs access to the P uh, to ptrace permissions and uh, the SE Linux guys didn't want to give them gen uh, generalized access th for the package, so they uh, s said that users should uh, just enable the ptrace binary, uh, SE Linux boolean, and so they put it in their scriptlet, uh, in a scriptlet. Um, I'm going to be honest; that makes my skin crawl. <laughs> um, that should absolutely not be something that, the, uh, right. that is done on a, done without a user's express consent. Right. And I think that means need, I think I, I think we need to find I think we need to find a better way. Okay. Yeah, KDE doesn't agree with the, this decision either, and uh, I, I would be happy to go and talk. If, if you uh, remind me about this later, I would be happy to go and talk to the SE Linux folks about doing that right. I think that's a good example of a place where, well, all you really want is uh, for SE Linux booleans, okay, apparently we need some solution for packages to be able to enable or disable them. They should have a tool that has a drop in directory. You should drop uh, a file in there. File trigger should handle it. I still don't agree. But it's a better solution. It's, a, it's, better than the car, it's better than the scripted solution, but I still don't agree that uh, SE Linux booleans should ever be changed without a user's consent. That's not my. <laughs> I don't get to decide that. Okay. But I do uh, get to decide. I think Randy was next. What are we talking about? I'm sorry. Uh, it's a package that jumps its KDE page to a file as like a backup of what we do the upgrade. And, you know, uh, I wonder if, if that's in any way like happening. Have you ever seen that anywhere else? Oh. The question is if have, we've seen a, if seen any packages that dump their database to a uh, file before doing an upgrade. Um, isn't that the recommended way to do an upgrade for uh, MariahDB or uh, MySQL? I, I feel. I mean. Um, Again, yeah, that's that's gross and it makes my skin crawl. Uh, but I don't. That really should also not be happening in a scriptlet. I, we should be talking to them about doing that in a, a, a helper unit. Yeah, that seems like something that should happen as a as a helper unit. Uh, yeah, with one of the other fun things about scriptlets is that we don't have any idea how much disk they're going to take up, which is why sometimes you try to do an install and it's like in midway through you're out of disk because scriptlets can do things like back up an enormous database without telling you, and then it, and then you're just out of luck. So wow, yeah. Um, that should yeah, so that makes the up, that would make the upgrade unreliable. Whereas putting in something so in something like a, a service unit would mean that the upgrade succeeded, and then your individual uh, applications had had an issue that you can then go and resolve. Um, that's an interesting question. I think that probably there needs to be some sort of so when we do start talking about and this at some point this talk should include a, a, we should start talking about uh, upgrades and migrations. And probably part of doing an upgrade or a migration would involve backing up. Like that might be a thing that some stuff needs to do. I can't assert that that's never going to be needed. And so I'm not saying you should delete it. 
market, though. <laughs> Figure out, or like, put a big old comment around it that says, hey, this is doing an enormous backup. And then, uh, I think in general, if you see, we should start marking things like that so that we can figure out which packages do this sort of thing and then start figuring out what we actually need to do and also to be able to pull those things out and um, put them in their right place. Right, uh, just a, a Florian okay. has been trying to interject something for Florian. a while. I'm sorry? I said there is a way to actually resolve space for updates like this but of course not for a database that has some recovery size. But right. you are able to put uh, ghost files into your package to make room for doing stuff. Sure. Right, right. You can reserve space with ghost files, but it doesn't work for yeah dynamically created files, right? So if your file grows depending on the number of other things on the disk, and there are a lot of other things on the disk, then we have no idea what's going to happen. Right. Yes. So I took a look at everyone's favorite Oh boy! Thank you for that. So depmod is a is a catalog, right? It's a it's a list of <coughs> here are the kernel modules that are on the system. So it is a dynamically created file that does need to be created um, that for proper function. Um, it should be probably handled by a file trigger. Something should notice, oh hey, there's a new kernel, and then kick that off. Um, at least in the RPM world. And then something like we have to agree on what that path is, and then other tools can key off of the fact that oh this file now exists, and now I know what to do to install a new kernel. Uh, so both both of those really like. I don't know what magic happens in new, there's a lot of weird magic that happens in new uh, kernel package. Like that's also what does, um, it adds your new bootloader entry and things like that. And so that's another, you're creating dynamically made files that do need to be there and written correctly for that to work. So yeah, file triggers should happen yeah. there. Um, we'll work with you, and by we I mean he, yeah. uh, <laughs> to um, fix that. Yeah, we, we have pretty consciously been avoiding thinking about the kernel case because that is Definitely the most complicated one we have in the pack in the uh, distribution at this point. Yeah. But, but it sounds like it's you know general, we generalize it. This is just the file trigger switch. Yep. Okay. Sure. Yep. Yeah. It's updating a cache. I mean, yes. Uh, it would be very nice to get rid of all of them, but if we if we manage to get it down to that's the only one left, I'm still going to throw a party. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Oh, there are. OK, so depmod in file triggers works in other distributions. Yeah. Oh, uh, I repeat for the uh, recording. That's good to know. Cool. All right, are there any other questions or? Yeah. So, uh, what do we do force people to remove their script lines? Because, for example, uh, those um, uh, install info and you know, some other script lines uh, are not handled by file trigger in people. And people then do have their spec file reports on all kinds of shit, like uh, open source from 2010. Okay, so the, to repeat the question back, uh, it's basically what do we do about people who's, uh, who, after we've had someone like Igor go, go through and do a mass package update to, uh, to remove the scriptlets, uh, end up ac adding it back in either intentionally or accidentally because they're keeping their spec file in, you know, keeping in, uh, matched with Apple, which may, which may not have that functionality. Um, I think we probably want to take, uh, take that one a bit to Fesco. I think we pr should probably set a, uh, be setting a rule that they're no longer allowed to do that and just start writing some scripts to monitor the full, you know, the, the, that tarball of all the spec files and just see when the, if those get re-added, the auto file a bug and say, no, you can't do this. Because I suspect that more often than not, that's happening by accident uh, rather than on purpose. So I think, that'll, I think that'll probably work itself out if we can automate letting people know about it. Um. Oh, actually, uh, I have. The, I, I wanted to propose sort of an idea. Okay. Um, so, one of the problems that we have here is we have to go through an enormous amount of, and you know, luckily we have talented people who will actually write tools to parse all of the scriptlets and try and find places where you're doing naughty things and fix it for you. Um, but we can't always do that. And I'm thinking that um, one of the things we might want to start talking about is whether we should split scriptlets by uh, task. So that you have your your you can have two postscripts, but if you have upgrade stuff, that goes in a separate postscript from your initial install. I'm, this may be a thing we want to do. That uh, would require uh, changes to RPM, I think. No, you can you can somebody tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm 90% sure you can have multiple postscripts and it just runs them in order. You can have multiple postscripts, but the last time I tried it, uh, only the last one you wrote ran. Okay, well we'll we'll not. All right, forget I said that. <laughs> it was a bad idea. <laughs> Pretend I said nothing. We'll figure something out. Um, anyway. Uh, could you go back to 
this slide it lists uh, GPS that could be replaced with file triggers, just for a second. That it used to be a... This one, or? Uh, yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which? Uh, it's, it was the last one, I think. The first one you just showed. There, there's, there's six, so this is the only one about, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, it's perfectly doable. Uh, I know about that because we, we just did this several years ago. Uh, it's a different distribution, but it just shows that it's possible. Uh, also, alternatives and all this stuff. Oh, uh, do you mind? Do you mind if I ask which distribution uh, has already done this? Because uh, I can't read that. Ah, Alt. Okay. So wait. Well, that's that's good to know because we should really be uh, exploring what you did and try to re replicate it. Yeah. So you're saying that. So you're saying. So wait. Uh, did I hear correctly? You're saying that Alt Linux has a config file format for alternatives. We use a different. Okay, we, d we don't have a... We don't have one at that all. That doesn't exist. I so. sort of proposed an idea, but we never uh, wrote we just, it. Yeah. But you have. Uh, if, you, if, have it, if you have one, we, let's, 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 let's talk. We have a config files for them, yeah. Okay, yeah, we we're going to we're gonna steal that from you. Thank you for writing it. Yes. <laughs> we're not it's stealing, we're collaborating. Oh, it's open source, yeah. yeah. We're collaborating in a unidirectional yeah. manner. Absolutely. <laughs> and the question I would like to ask is about uh, adding your groups. Could you elaborate a bit? How would you like to... Not just adding markers, maybe. Uh, what? How would you like to implement this? I'm actually gonna. If if he's willing to, I'd like to have Harold explain this one uh, because you're more you're closer to it than I am. Um, basically, these macros call out to some <laughs> for the <record. laughs> the, These macros call out to some uh, Lua code, which then internally stores them in in a big variable, uh, RPM variable, and then extends this mm -hmm. JSON string with uh, the data, which groups to add and which, which users to add in the beginning. And then when you call the OS build pre, it will generate a pre-script like you had before with the user at group at like it should be even with system D uh, users. Yeah, so even the, the general idea. If you want to and the OS build install thing will dump the JSON file basically to disk, install it, or can render the temp files or system D sys users files also. That depends on what we like to have it to render, and the, the OS build files just pick up the file name. It just generates the... Right. So the, the general concept is that the OS build whatever uh, macros build sort of a configuration in memory, and then we have other things that write out the appropriate things to you know, act, do whatever you need to do in pre or in install to actually uh, activate that configuration on the system. The nice thing about this is if you're not, you know, if you're installing the package, but you're not going to be running scriptlets, the, the, the configuration it generated is still in the package, and so we can make the changes we need without running those scriptlets. Right. And it's in a format that is easily parsable. Right. That's a lot of spec firework. I think it's like... It's significant. It is significant. It, 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 so the yeah, question is, it's a lot of spec file work. Uh, my, my arg return argument is it's less complicated than the script it's replacing, and it is, uh, and it is extensible for other tasks. There must be better ways to do this. There must be a better way to do this is always going to be true. <laughs> I mean, the better way to do it is not do it. And actually, I do believe that Florian has talked about um, adding users and groups as sort of first class objects in RPM at some point. This is the way to go. Right. Yeah, but that's, that's going that to be years. Uh, that's going to be years down the road. And at the very least, if, if we've implemented that in the middle. Yeah. It will take a long time for, even if we added that today, it would be uh, probably a couple of years before it was uh, on all of the systems, even just in the Fedora infrastructure. And then, so we can't rely on it uh, for many releases. And then when you start thinking about, say, something like CentOS or Red Hat Enterprise Linux, it wouldn't be available there for several years, probably. So we need some sort of way to get from where we're at right now, which is crazy town, to the nice place where RPM handles users and groups um, 
properly for us. So I agree that the better way to do it would be to have RPM just handle it, at, but <coughs> we need some sort of a, um, a transition. So that's what these are for. They're not my favorite thing either, but what are you going to do? So I, I have a question about five triggers. So are you fine with packages doing pretty, pretty much anything in five triggers, or are, this, uh, are you also want to, to restrict these things? Because I have some, I'm asked because I have uh, at least two, create, two creative uses of five triggers that I deployed. One, one actually at, at Fedora, and one is so weird that I wouldn't ever want to submit it to Fedora. Uh, okay. And that you can do, uh, because the fun thing is you can react on, on files installed by other packages, no matter whether they, they're installed before or after your package. OK. Um, so the question is, I think to boil it down, the question is what restrictions are we willing to put on what, trans fi what, what uh, various file triggers can do? Um, because you can do some pretty strange things, including uh, trigger on other packages' files. I think the fir uh, I don't think we have a clear idea what those restrictions are going to be yet, but I think we've established as a policy that uh, when you create a, fi a file trigger of any kind, you're only allowed to do it for things that apply to your package. And if you're doing it for something else, we should probably say, no, you can't do that. Yeah, I think that's um, a good point. And that, uh, do we have any restrictions on what packages can ship file triggers or, or what can be done? And it sounds like the answer is no, we don't. And I really think we should. Hey. My, my goal would be that. For the uh, most part, packages, uh, most packages aren't doing any of them just because it's a right. lot of upfront work. Yeah, <laughs> and it's usually not necessary. So, so one, one thing that, that, that we do ship in Fedora now uh, that I wrote is that uh, to convert uh, the Hansberg dictionaries from, from the system Hansberg to the format expected by Qt Web Engine, the Chrome format. And there's actually a tool that ships with Qt Web Engine that will do the conversion for you. And I, I actually wrote a file trigger that, that, re, that uh, whenever you install a system answer dictionary, the file trigger will uh, recognize it and automatically call the Qt Web Engine uh, uh, dictionary conversion tool and store the converted dictionary in a Qt Web Engine directory. OK, so the, the statement was uh, there. There's a file trigger uh, to convert uh, one uh, dictionary format into, into another that's used by, uh, by KDE, and it's technically triggering on something else's uh, data. Uh, I feel like that's probably something we would allow on an exception basis and probably prefer to have a rule against it without an exception. Uh, I think that would, be, uh, that would almost certainly ga get an exception, but I think it would probably have to ask for it. All right. Any other questions? Cool. Um, so I guess uh, s summing up, uh, let's kill any pe any scriptlet that we can, uh, just for the fun of it. I mean, uh, I don't, <laughs> not just for the fun of it. Like no. we're not going to really get rid they're, of all of them, but yeah, they're they're actually. Uh, uh, so it turns out that when we asterisk, this is a lie at the beginning. That was not true because the profit in this is easier maintainability and uh, better and faster uh, deployments going yeah. forward. So there really is profit, it's just not monetary. I think anybody who's tried to write any sort of image build tool has eventually come to the realization that, that unless we deal with scriptlets, it's never going to be fast or reliable or secure, and we got to start somewhere. So uh, you all braved the maze to get here. You're the best and brightest. Like, help us do this. Um, so were there any other things we needed to talk about? Or? No, I think we covered it. All right, cool. Well, thanks all for coming. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah.